It is with great pleasure that I introduce all of you to Peg O'Connor. She is a longtime recovering alcoholic. She is a philosophy professor at Gustavus Adolphus College, that's in Minnesota. And she's written a bunch of books that look fascinating. Um, her most recent uh, book published is Higher and Friendly Powers, Transforming Addiction and Suffering. It's based on the writings of William James. And William James, uh, I've, I don't know very much about him, but he was a um, professor at Harvard University. And much of what uh, Bill Wilson uh, based our program on are the writings and the uh, inspiration from um, Mr. James. And Peg is going to be talking to us about her her latest book, and she's, I, I can, I just can hardly wait. Um, she's written a bunch of books, and some of them are based on something I've never heard of. It's the Wittgenstein uh, theory, and I hope she talks about that a little bit so I can understand it, but it's with great pleasure that I introduce you all to Peg. Sit back, relax, maybe get out a piece of paper to take a couple notes, and Peg, we can hardly wait. Well, gosh, thanks so much to Patrick for having invited me and Susie being our gracious host and to see all of you all around the world in some ways um, living the dream that Bill Wilson must have had about what a group of alcoholics can do when any two of us get together. Amazing things can happen. So I, I'm just I'm, I'm tickled to be here and I um I know me and I will not be going an hour because I think there's so much value in discussion and I am totally fine. If anyone has a question, just interrupt me. I'm used to teaching undergraduate students and if they have questions, I'd love to hear them right away rather than waiting. So I don't know if I'm violating the norms here, but maybe you could put the question in a chat and Susie could be the moderator of that. If that, that would be acceptable. Um, so I will just start off about sort of how I became interested in what became this book, Higher and Friendly Powers. And that involves telling some of my story to motivate my interest. So um, I am Peg and I am an alcoholic. And like many of you, I, I started very young and I was an overachiever in my drinking. I got really good at it really fast, which presented a problem. And I went to my first AA meeting at the age of 19. I don't even remember how this came to pass, but I ended up going to an AA meeting and I ran out like my pants were on fire because I couldn't square myself with this notion of God um, doing things to or for me. I came from a Catholic background, having gone to grammar school and high school uh, that were Catholic. And my notion of God was not one of a benevolent, all loving being who was accepting. It was as a very judgmental uh, super being. And so AA wasn't going to work for me. And I stayed away from AA until I was nearly 20 years sober. And one of the things I realized was that I needed to become more nimble, inflexible in my recovery. So I won't sort of go back into why I drank and how I drank. That isn't necessarily the interesting thing for me. The interesting thing for me was coming to see philosophy. So as Susie said, I, I'm a philosopher. And philosophy, I think, is a wonderful discipline that has a lot to offer those of us who struggle with suffering in myriad forms, but addiction in particular. And I have found people in these rooms, physical rooms, uh, cyber rooms, to be some of the most philosophical people I have noticed. So what's interesting for me is the way in which Philosophy has really informed my own recovery and the ways that I think that philosophy can be useful to others struggling with suffering and trying to make meaning and value, oftentimes out of really difficult things in our lives. And that is one of the joys of philosophy. And so I had known that Bill Wilson had made reference to William James as a co-founder of AA. And I couldn't figure out what he meant by that. 
So William James was an American philosopher, physician, and psychologist uh, who was born in 1842 and died in 1910. So William James died in 1910. Bill Wilson didn't sober up in the Charles B. Towns Hospital until 1934. So there's a, about a 25-year gap then. So what kind of influence could William James have had on Bill Wilson? And so many of you probably know the mythology of how AA started. And if you don't, there's a wonderful book out called Writing the Big Book that actually looks at the early formation of AA and looks at how it is that Bill Wilson was the primary author of the book Alcoholics Anonymous, or as we call it, the big book. And if, if you're a nerdy little person like me, you don't just read the first 164 pages, you go and you look in the appendix. You look to see what else is going on there. And in the second appendix, Bill Wilson makes reference to what he calls an educational conversion. He's talking about spirituality. And so all this was confusing to me. So I thought, I've got to figure out what was going on. How did Bill Wilson come to see William James as a co-founder of AA? So here's the story. And this is referenced in that book called Writing the Big Book. So when Bill Wilson went into the town's hospital just before Christmas in 1934, he was utterly defiant. And Bill Wilson was someone who had an almost unbridled confidence in his ability to do anything except this one thing, which was stay sober. He had tried numerous times. He had failed numerous times. And this was kind of a last gasp effort on his part. Uh, he and his wife were living with his in-laws. They had no money. He was a failed businessman. And he went into this hospital, an asylum for the inebriate, to use the language of the time. And he threw up his hands and said, if there is a God, show yourself now. I'll do anything, anything to, you know, not have this desire to drink, to be at my center. And he talks about the ways in which he experienced this gust that he knew wasn't just wind, but it was spirit. And he said, my desire to drink then was lifted. And I'm sure there was some ebullience and some jubilation, but there was also a great worry from him. Was he going crazy? Was he having hallucinations? And hallucinations would be a typical thing for someone who was probably going through alcohol withdrawal and somebody who had probably been treated with belladonna, which was one of the standard treatments for alcohol withdrawal. So he thinks he's losing his mind. But thankfully, he had a friend, Ebby Thacker, who was a member of the Oxford Group, so another important piece of AA history. And Ebby gave Bill this book called The Varieties of Religious Experience that had been published in 1902 by William James. So in that book, and I'll just call it Varieties, in Varieties, James is really interested in exploring how it is that spiritual impulses burn at the center of people. So James, as a psychologist, a physician, and a philosopher, really believed that spiritual impulses are as much a part of human nature as our biological, physical considerations, as our mental states or psychological affects. And this is all new language at the time in the, in the early 1900s. And so James was really interested at looking at people for whom those spiritual impulses burned as an acute fever. And he said, you know, we Christians, and he had originally given what became Varieties as a series of lectures to um, a group of very well-educated Euro-Scots people at the University of Edinburgh, 1901 and 1902. So James would regularly say, we Christians, but he would also say, we have to be careful not to assume that Christianity is right or the true religion and that there are multiple ways of looking at the at the world at the universe and I'll, and I'll come back to that later but in that wonderful book it is this massive compendium it runs about 500 pages long and it's about stories for whom spiritual impulses burn at the center of people so christian saints are kind of a paradigm case of that but he also talked about literary figures. He talked about uh, Leo Tolstoy. He made reference to uh, the founder of Quakerism. He made reference to other well-known literary people of the time that perhaps we no longer hear of. And in that book, Varieties, James has 
several examples of men, and it is just men, but he doesn't think in any way it could only be men. He does have some example about women. Men who we would say are people like us, who were raging alcoholics, or there was one who struggled with carnal mirth, what we might now call sex addiction, and that these people undergo remarkable transformations. They undergo conversions where they feel like they are reborn, regenerated, rejuvenated. And that's exactly what happened to Bill Wilson. And so varieties in many ways provide an, an explanatory framework for Bill Wilson to think about what had just happened to him. Oh, he had a religious conversion. And for Bill Wilson, it worked for him to think that it was God who fundamentally changed something in him. So in varieties, though, William James is very careful not to have his thumb on the scale. He's very careful not to privilege one set of beliefs over another. And what William James says is that in order for people to undergo a conversion, they need to, what does he say? He says, people who are ready for a conversion are people who have a sense that there's something really wrong with the way that they're living. And I think that all of us who have struggled with addiction could write a very long, our own compendium of everything that was wrong with the way that we're living. So we have to have a sense of what's wrong, but we also need something positive that we can start to orient ourselves towards or aim our life towards. Because if you just have the negativity, everything that's wrong, you're going to get stuck and probably just drill down into yourself. But James says, when you have a positive ideal, you then are ready to undergo a conversion. So, so far, everything is tracking with, with what Bill W. was saying. But here's the rub. James says two important things. One, there are multiple higher powers. And two, a conversion is only a psychological process. That a conversion even if you believe it was authored by a providential God, is not a proof for God's existence. It's maybe proof for what you yourself believe, what your sort of the expression of the time was over beliefs, what your frameworks were, what your background assumptions and values were. It may prove that you hold these values, but it doesn't prove that a God or any gods exist at all. So what happens is that Bill Wilson reads varieties, and maybe they were reading in the Oxford group, and maybe he read it on his own. There's good indication that he read it. And he took some important concepts from varieties, but he took them in a way that was contrary to how William James was using it, using those terms. So what I wanted to do was figure out, really, what did William James mean by higher and friendly powers? And what is important that we take away from William James separate from what AA has to offer? So on the one hand, I offer a mild, a mild corrective, but I think we know that many people, like I did, struggled with this notion of God, and it keeps a lot of us away from these rooms. We feel that we have to subscribe to a certain set of beliefs or, you know, in in the worst kind of screed published about Alcoholics Anonymous, it gets called a cult, it gets called a religion, you know, that you have to have these kinds of beliefs. And what I wanted to do was return that notion of higher powers, and it's higher and friendly powers, plural, to its original expansive sense as a way to try to make AA seem like a viable option for people who have kept themselves away because of the God language. So that was sort of mission one. And mission two was to say William James offers us so much more than what Bill Wilson borrowed from and made use of, made very good use of, that there's so much more that William James has to offer people struggling with various kinds of suffering, that I wanted people to find a wonderful traveling companion in William James, both for the struggles and for the transformation. So I'll come back to that, but I want to tell you a little bit about William James, because I know a lot of time, I know I have this, I like to know that someone who is 
what, studying people like me, people like us, that they've got some kind of credibility, they've got some kind of skin in the game, that there's nothing worse than feeling like you're just being treated as an object of scientific, medical, or social scientific examination, and that our, our humanity, our, our personhood kinds of draws, drops out of consideration. And so I think it's important to know something about who William James was as a person and not just his great achievements and accomplishments. Because in the, the last half of the 1900s up to you know, the time he died, William James was a towering intellectual figure across much of the European world. And he was someone who was highly sought after and underneath a lot of it, he remained the same, very vulnerable, very fragile young person known as Willie James, even when he was at the height of his professional accomplishment. And I think for me, that's always a good object lesson. Um, and I know we talk about AA, we shouldn't compare our insides to people's outsides. But James could write about suffering because he, he suffered so acutely himself. And so William James, if, if people know who Henry James is, the novelist who spent most of his adult life living in the UK in London, William James is his older brother. And William James and Henry James had two younger brothers and they also had a younger sister. So if you're interested in any kind of feminist work, uh, their sister Alice James is very well known as a diarist, and she died of uh, breast cancer very early on. She was just in her 40s. But the James family was extraordinarily wealthy. That's the first thing to know. And their father, Henry James Sr., was a towering figure who struggled with his own alcohol use and struggled with his own mental health. So in the mid 1800s, late to 1800s, there was this diagnosis called neurasthenia. And physicians talked about the condition that it was oftentimes, well, wealthy, well-educated people who had a very nervous temperament, that they were psychologically fragile in a way, they were physically frail in certain kinds of ways. And the entire James family seemed to have suffered from it in many different kinds of ways. And what's interesting is their father, Henry Sr., decided that young Willie and Harry, who would go on to become William James, the novelist, that those were his two gifted and talented children. And he would do anything to further their education. They moved seven times in about a three-year period, bouncing back and forth between Geneva and London, Newport, Rhode Island, outside of Boston, back over to London, because Henry was searching for the perfect education for them. And meanwhile, the two younger brothers, Garth and, and Bob, so this is in the early 1600s, and the Civil War is raging in the United States. And the father forbids William and Henry from enlisting in the Union army, but he encourages his two other sons to do it. And one of those sons, Bob, becomes an absolute raging alcoholic. There's um, a whole series of letters between young Bob and his father, where his father is fully aware of how much young Bob is suffering. He wants nothing more than to be an artist, but his father keeps pushing him to stay in the military, even though he's in abject terror and fear and suffering acutely. And meanwhile, his older brother, William, is busy pursuing his education at Harvard. He's well away from the war. And there's always a certain kind of guilt that William James carried with him. And his brother, Bob, was an alcoholic his entire life. And he would spend years in and out of asylums for the inebriate. And he ended up living quite close to William James. He ended up living full time for five years. Um, at what we'd now probably call an inpatient treatment center. Uh, again, that point about money, money helped uh, to smooth a lot of the troubles um, for the James family. So William James knew his own acute suffering closely. He was someone who seriously contemplated suicide. He is someone who 
devolved in what he called a pathological melancholia that he thought that there was no value in the world and, and why was he living? And William James would have these periodic bouts or these periodic cycles of this, you know, what we'd now call severe clinical depression. That's such a dry language. Instead of talking about melancholia, talking about angst, talking about anxiety before it became a psychological concept. It was a religious concept from the philosopher Soren Kierkegaard who said that anxiety is always about the future. There's always a, a gap. There's fundamental spiritual imbalance within people. And William James experienced all those things. So he had his own suffering and he had the suffering of his brother. And you have to think that given the examples that James included in this wonderful book, Varieties, that, that William James was thinking about his little brother, Bob, that no matter what he did, he could never help him out. Here he was, the towering intellectual of his day, a physician, a psychologist, and he couldn't ever figure out sort of what this addiction was and, and why don't people seem to get better from it. And at the end of the book, Varieties, James, in effect, says, you know, about drunkenness, I'm just going to have to say maybe it's part of the mystical consciousness that we can't understand, he said. But what he understood clearly was that alcohol excites when he says the yes feature in us. It makes us say yes to things because what we now know is alcohol is a disinhibitor. So William James had the street credibility for me. And, and I hope that you might find that he's got the credibility for you. He was never trying to fix people. He was never um, standing in judgment of people. He had a genuine curiosity, not just as a physician, but as about a humanist, about how is it that people live with such great suffering and they can still do remarkable things. And doing that remarkable thing might be deciding to change their relationship to drug or alcohol or to have these kinds of conversions. So William James, to me, offers an incredible resource to all of us because he's got wonderful ways of cataloging different kinds of suffering that I think many of us who struggle with addiction might feel some common cause with. So, you know, everything now is on a continuum with, with the um, psychology and psychiatric association. So we've got, in the United States, we talk about a substance use disorder. It's on a continuum. It could be, I think there are 10 criteria and if you meet two to three, you've got a mild substance use disorder, four to five is moderate and six plus, six plus is severe. And, I think that language is wonderfully helpful and interesting, but to me, it always seems kind of dry. And I think that there are better ways to understand kind of stages of suffering. So for me, addiction is a particular kind of suffering. There are different ways to understanding the dynamics of suffering that I find in William James. So William James, as I said, he's an astute observer of humanity and human nature. And he says, I'm going to speak in generalities here, but I really think there are two kinds of people in the world. There are the people who are the optimists. He calls them the sunny siders. He said, those are the people who wear the glasses with the sky blue tint. And they're the ones who always think that the glass is half full with something really yummy to drink. And goes on to say, you know, those optimistic people, they're the ones who feel like they have been born already with, you know, credits in their bank, you know, that just everything is good for them. And these sunny siders, James say, are completely foreign to him. He is not that kind of person, nor was anyone in his family. And the other type of people he said, so you've got the healthy minded, he said, there are the sick or the divided souls. And I think that's actually a wonderful way to understand what happens to us when we're active in our addictions. We become sick souls. And what he means by that is that we might say these, there are five stages of world sickness. We might say they're progressive. He says that what starts to happen is that 
different kinds of fear begin to take root in us. And, and fear is really important. Fear plays an important evolutionary role in our life. But fear can become too much. And it starts attaching to the wrong things. It starts attaching to too many things. And he borrows an expression from a writer called Horace Fletcher, who was part of the mind cure movement that goes on to become Christian science a little bit later on. And the term I love is fear thought. So there's forethought, which is good. That's looking ahead. It's imagining what might happen, but it's keeping it kind of in the right perspective, keeping it the right shape. We might say that's being circumspect. Now that you're looking at some courses of action, I could do this, I could do that, but mm, this is the better one because forethought is really important. Fear thought, on the other hand, is when those fears really start to take off and they just shoot out. And your thinking becomes governed by fear thought, like, oh my gosh, this bad thing is going to happen. You know, the person who really struggles with fear thought is the one who goes from zero to 100 miles per hour or kilometers, depending upon your unit of measurement, in a split second, because they think that's the only kind of thing that can happen. And so James's diagnosis is that fears start to what? They start to affect a person by either attaching and growing in certain kinds of ways or almost kind of degrading or causing disintegration and other kinds of good things within a person. So James says these five stages of world sickness, he says the first two you can recover from because they're a matter of your attitude, the attitude with which you meet the world. And he says there's joy chill. So joy chilled means that a person starts to experience less pleasure in things or less joy or less happiness in things that before had really animated them. You know, it's just a little less, you know, the shine comes off a little bit. The, the enthusiasm for these things dims a little bit. That's stage one. And stage two is joy destroyed where someone who really loved doing something before now longer gets nothing from it. So it goes from chilling to being destroyed. And James says, those two things are pretty curable, that people can adjust their attitudes, they can calibrate their responses. Self-knowledge is important here. You know, if, if you are beginning to not have as much fun as you used to doing the things that bring you great joy, William James might say, that should be a real warning sign for you. And you can interrogate yourself. You can figure out what's going on with you. Is there a mismatch between you and the world? You can adjust your expectations. You can, you know, really um, recalibrate your hopes. And you can kind of bring yourself back into alignment so you're not suffering in a certain kind of way. But then when we get down to the, the last three phases, James says there's a fundamental switch that happens here, that the wrongness isn't, oh God, I need an attitude adjustment. I need to check my attitude. That the wrongness isn't something with me. The wrongness is a fundamental part of the person or it's a fundamental part of the world. So the first stage of this last of these really three damaging one, in philosophy, we talk about anhedonia. That's just a fancy word for no pleasure. So whereas before it was maybe episodic where, you know, I really used to love playing tennis, but eh, I don't care if I ever play again. Now it's, I don't get pleasure out of much of anything anymore. Nothing brings me pleasure. You know, it's, it's this kind of flatlining of interest. And, and then a person starts to pull down into themselves. And that's going to be a, a characteristic dynamic that James is going to say, this is what happens with acute suffering and addiction is one of them. People start to contract, their world starts to shrink because things that were fun bring you outside of yourself. When nothing is fun, you tend to start closing down in a certain kind of way. So no pleasure. The next phase is what he calls active anguish. That's when a person is actively struggling. Am I worth anything? I mean, is there anything good about me? I mean, why is it that I can never get ahead? Why is it that I keep screwing up. And you can see the way in which that active anguish where everything might be a referendum on my worth as a person. And I think oftentimes, I know for me, 
when I was really developing my addiction, everything became a referendum on my worthiness of a person. So I, I was a competitive tennis player as a young person at the same time that I was drinking. And for me, every shot that I missed was a referendum, not just on whether I was a good tennis player, but whether I had any worth of a person. So you can imagine that was not good. That, you know, if every shot, every point, every game, every set, every match was a way for me to confirm that I really was worthless, that there was nothing good about me and that I just was always fearful that others would see this in me. And then finally, the worst stage, and this is the stage where James later admits that he landed and that one of the examples of this in varieties is his own report of what happened to him that he had um, he dissembled about. He didn't want to be the center of this, so he just said, oh, that a correspondent wrote to me. He wrote it to himself, but he obscured that fact because he didn't want the audience thinking, oh, oh, he contemplated suicide? What, he was really like that? It's only much later on in a letter that he said, yeah, that, that was me. But he, he, he describes this worst stage of a pathological melancholia as a panic fear. It's where everything in the world is hostile to you because the world is a fundamentally hostile place, that there's no meaning or value in the world. And at the time when James was a young man, at the time when he's an older man writing these lectures, um, part of German philosophy, particularly from Schopenhauer, was very much that the world is a cold, indifferent place, that there is no meaning or value. So what is it like as an individual to really embrace that, to say the world has no meaning or value? So in the example that William James introduces to discuss this panic fear, he talks about a young man and he was, he was in medical school at this point and he was in his mid to late twenties and he's in Germany studying at the time. And he goes into the language of the time, an asylum for the insane. And he meets a young man who is not exactly catatonic, but is there almost as if, and again, this is William James, as if mummified, but slightly rocking back and forth that there's an emptiness there, but for sheer torment and horror. And this person is just rocking back and forth, rocking back and forth, rocking back and forth. And William James writes, that shape I am that William James sees himself as no different from that man in the asylum that he is supposed to be studying or treating. And William James at that point will later say, and I understood myself at that moment when I came out of there to have had a conversion. He said, I had to believe in free will. I had to believe that my actions make a difference that everything isn't determined, written in advance by a God, that it isn't a hard, cold, valueless, meaningless world, but that what I can do will make a difference. So he said, I had to make an active choice to begin to believe that what I did made an action, made a difference, and then to act. And that much later on in varieties becomes his definition of faith. He said, I had to become willing to live on a maybe or a possibility that what I could do would make a difference. And my faith in that helps to bring about fact. So there's a radical switch here between faith and fact. And faith is really quite ordinary. Faith isn't in a providential God. He said in a piece he wrote much later in his life that, that faith is a what if, it's a working hypothesis. And the example he gave much later in life, he's giving a talk called Is Life Worth Living? And he's giving it to young college students, perhaps who are really worried about whether there's any value in their life. He understood these students because he had been this student. And he says, you know, faith runs throughout all dimensions of life. You have faith that the plumber you call can fix the leak under the sink. You have faith that people will drive on the correct side of the road. That faith really is the engine oil of much of our life. 
But faith gets a really bad reputation with the rise of modern science. It kind of gets written off. It's kind of, um, it's woo-woo, it's voodoo, it's, you know, it's not rational or anything like that. And William James is quite clear that faith is simply believing in something where the results are not certified in advance. He says everyone has the right to believe in things when that belief might help to bring about the fact that is believed in. And the example he gives is all of us worry about the question at some point, maybe we meet somebody new. Gosh, I wonder if that person likes us. Now, does that person like us? And James says, you take it on faith that they do. And what that means is you act as if they do like you. Because you know, if you act as if they don't like you, they're not going to like you. So faith attaches to no religious dogma. And in fact, James says, I've never been interested in theology. I'm not interested in proofs of God. I'm not interested in any of that. I'm interested in how people experience spiritual impulses. And then that brings us to the topic of higher and friendly powers. What do these things mean? So James describes anything spiritual. Spiritual is anything that has to do with the belief that there's more to the universe than just me. Surprise. Um, that none of us is an island unto him, her, or themself. And James says spirituality has to do with a kind of relationship that one has with whatever they decide to treat solemnly and seriously. He says that a spiritual impulse is anything in which a person stands in a solemn relationship. And he says what matters about spirituality isn't the origin, but it's what one does with it. And so in talking about the various kinds of suffering that those who suffer from the five stages of world sickness has, he says people just as I said, they begin to contract because the world is hostile. Anything coming in towards me is a threat. I'm afraid of it. I'm fearful of it. He said higher and friendly powers, and he talked about it being a friendly power, and he talked about a higher power, and he talked about higher powers, but higher and friendly powers are anything that cause a person to maybe become a little more expansive. So if contraction is the qualif or the kind of mm, the typical characteristic of suffering or addiction, expanding is the characteristic feature of a spiritual life. And James has all these wonderful examples of what people might want to expand towards, either beyond an individual or within an individual. So among the examples James includes of higher and friendly powers, he talks about the ideals of truth and beauty from the transcendentalist Ralph Waldo Emerson, who is a very close family friend. Having family friends like Ralph Waldo Emerson, not bad. He said, enthusiasm for humanity, having a sense of human decency, having moral principles, patriotism, a belief in maybe an imminent divinity within nature, that there's something sacred about nature. Moral principles. He says, anything larger will do if it helps you to take the next step. So that's a very different understanding of what a higher power is and what it can do. For James, a higher power doesn't do anything to a person. A higher power is something that a person creates and that then enables them to do for themselves. So one of the most important examples that James offers of a higher and friendly power comes from, um, comes from Henry David Thoreau living at Walden Pond in the 1850s. And he's living in this little cabin because he's got to get away from civilization. He needs to get away from society. He wants to just really focus in. And Henry David Thoreau is walking through the woods one day on a misty morning. And he said, I suddenly had this sense as if the pine needles were befriending me. 
And it wasn't just that he felt a connection with nature, a connection with the pine, pine needles, a connection with the trees. He talked about it in more almost kind of sacred terms, as if I'm having a communion, I'm truly sharing with. And that was one of the most important examples that William James gave of higher and friendly powers. So what those higher and friendly powers enable us to do when we harness them is we can reach out to other people, to beliefs, to ways of being in the world, to communities, to others in a group like this. But we can also reach inward into ourselves because the other crucial example that James gives of a higher and friendly power is a belief that I have or can be a better self. So higher and friendly powers, there are as many as there are individuals and that each person can choose their higher and friendly power for him, her, or themselves. And that James talks about a person who undergoes a conversion of a sudden sort, like Bill Wilson said, or, or James said, there are just as many slow, gradual conversions. A person who begins to feel perhaps that joy chilled or joy destroyed, the person who begins to feel that um, his life isn't congruent, his principles aren't lining up, his actions uh, belie his faith, I mean, all those sorts of things, that those changes can happen really, really slowly. A person doesn't have to reach the point of, this is a term from Bill Wilson, ego deflation. So Bill Wilson's story in the first 164 pages of the big book really sets the table. I think for many people thinking about, oh, this is what's supposed to happen. And if I didn't have one of these big aha moments, maybe I never really was an alcoholic or an addict, or maybe I'm not really ready. I don't have that complete ego deflation or I haven't hit rock bottom. James says, no, 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 no. That people can change gradually over time and the effects are no less significant than the big sudden tsunami kind of conversions. And what James says is, you know, if I could get rid of any concept in AA, I would get rid of the concept of rock bottom. I think it's a dangerous, misleading concept um, because it makes it seem as if there is some objective point that everyone has to meet. And the hope is that, you know, someone sinks so low, they smack down and they're going to bounce up. And so, um, you know, that ego deflation language lends itself to that. But James has a different concept that I think is, is more useful. William James talks about a misery threshold, that each one of us has a certain degree of tolerance for suffering or from uncertainty. And that people who live, to go back to that broad set of categories, people who are what he called the healthy-minded, the sunny-siders, people like that like to stay above that misery threshold. They don't want to get too close to it. If they find themselves kind of sinking down, if their fear thought is maybe revving up too much, those people will self-correct, they'll course-correct more quickly than other people, and James was one of them, who become so familiar with their suffering, acute as it may be, that sometimes the devil you know is better than the devil that you don't know. And that they can sink so far below their misery threshold. But James says, and this is my point earlier about, you know, when people really start to sink, we have a sense of what's wrong or incomplete about how we're living. But do we have that, a positive ideal? And so this is where James might say a belief that you could be a better person is a higher and friendly power. It can serve that way. Why do self-help groups like AA work so well? Because I think those of us who have been in longer term recovery maybe help to provide that ideal for others just coming into these rooms. It's why we share our experience, strength, and hope. And so that misery threshold is unique for each one of us. And what it takes for us to change will be different. And that James and many others say that one of the great gifts of recovery is a certain kind of self-knowledge. And that's one of the great things we get from the spiritual transformation. James's language is lovely. We're reborn, we are regenerated, we are rejuvenated. 
We are new people because our, his expression was, our habitual center of personal energy has changed. So habitual center of personal energy. When we're in our using days, if our world really becomes reduced to that, drugs and using may be at the center. But as we begin to expand, as we begin to reach outward to others or inward into ourselves, as we become more expansive, we have more opportunities and we become more willing to live on possibilities like William James was himself when he was contemplating suicide. So I'm just gonna wind up by saying, I think Alcoholics Anonymous got a lot right from William James. So I don't know if this, in, in your meetings, you read the, um, the promises from the ninth step, from the ninth step, but those promises are so similar to what William James talks about, what happens to a raft of cowardly obstructions and what happens to your zigzagging in the world careening around. William James talks about, you know, the life of someone actively suffering. And I would say particularly with an addiction that life is one big cycle of drama, offense, repent, repair, repeat, that that craziness ends. And William James says, for those people who have spiritual impulses at our center, those of us who, he calls it bearing the fruits of the spiritual tree, he says we get a firmness of character. We're not careening, slamming around. We come to know who we are, that we have a more durable, more intentionally formed moral character. We have stability. We have equilibrium. He said, we can apprehend new truths about the world and about ourselves. And he says, we feel a, a sense of continuity with whatever this higher and friendly power is for us. And he says, finally, that we have a freedom and elation that comes from letting go of grievances. And so that those of us who, who work hard at recovery and who have overcome suffering in, in many different ways, the key of our life is gratitude and not grievance. And so when you meet the world with gratitude, he says, you know, your hands are open, that possibilities are perhaps welcome opportunities. They're not threats. And then the final thing that I will say in terms of, of talking about William James, and this was a, a this really came to me as a warning to me. So I, I said to you that I hadn't been in an AA meeting for about 20 years that I had been sober. And I realized that I wasn't paying enough attention to my recovery. I was just taking it for granted, treating it as a fact of the matter. I never really, I mean, I talked about it with my friends, but you know, I didn't, I wasn't working any kind of program of recovery. And I realized that I was running on autopilot. You know, I was highly functioning. I wasn't drinking, but I was highly functioning my lights were on, but I wasn't really home. And so I realized that I needed to be more flexible in my recovery. And I worried that I could, I could relapse, that, that, was, that is always a live option. I could relapse, but I needed to become more flexible and nimble in my recovery and being willing, I think, to embrace James's notion of well, what if, or maybes or possibilities, and to maybe try AA again. And I remain someone who is in and out of AA. I have enormous respect for AA. What AA gets right, it gets so right about the importance of our sharing our stories, where none of us is the paid expert, the disinterested one, diagnosing, doing any of that, and that we can provide the kinds of moral visions or provide moral compasses that we can show through our actions how life can be better and that we do that so well and we can live the ninth step promises but that we must always always be willing to try new and different things if we start to feel as if our recovery if our you know the our firmness of character our stability our equilibrium our sense of serenity if those are starting to slip, that we need to be proactive. And that's one takeaway message from 
William James, we must always be proactive with who we are and how we are in the world because who we are is so much a matter of how we're acting and with whom we're acting. And so my hope with this book, Higher and Friendly Powers, was to make James relevant for people who maybe who have never heard of him or have only ever seen a kind of oblique reference to him and to say that he is a wonderful traveling companion, whether you're in the acute suffering part, not just addiction, or if you are trying to reap the fruits of the spiritual tree to see that life can be joyful and that we always have the, the power, that we have the ability to make different choices and we can make choices about the attitudes with which we meet the world. And so I'll end there and say, you know, thank you for your time and listening. And I really look forward to the discussions.